Wonderful. Thank you. Well, what an exciting day. I mean, I've, I, I flew across the country to get here for this because I could not miss it. Uh, and one of the reasons why is because um, I wanted to impress my kids. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on a stage with three Nobel Prize winners. I thought that would impress them. And what they said was, what are you doing up there? Uh, and so what I'm doing up here is I'm going to ask the question that I hope that you want to ask. So that, that is what we're going to do. So, um, so on the screen, uh, we have a Nobel Prize winner in physics, Donna Strickland. Joining us from And then joining us also is uh, Dr. Rich Roberts, uh, Nobel Prize winner in medicine and physiology. And then finally, another Nobel Prize winner in physics, Saul Perlmutter. And so what we're going to do, I love the title of this, it's called the, you know, it says uh, the truth, trust, and hope, but then there's a subtitle for ours, which is the truth is out there. And, and it is, it is out there. And, you know, part of, uh, one of the things that's exciting about being with Nobel Prize winners is they actually discovered a little kernel of truth, a little kernel of truth uh, that excited everyone, uh, and in some ways turned over something that was thought before. And so we're going we're gonna to go through a discussion about what we've seen and heard today and our reactions to it. Um, and so a little bit of it will be covering some ground that's been covered, but from the perspective and the prisms that they bring to the table as Nobel Prize winners. And so we heard a, a bit about the historical context of the times in which we live. You heard about it from many of the speakers, including our magician. Um, and from the perspectives of Nobel Prize winners uh, in astrophysics, optical physics, and molecular biology, uh, Saul, why don't you start by giving us your observations about the history and what that history has uh, in terms of relevance for today. Well, I guess earlier today we heard a little bit about the uh, moment where people uh, started printing with the with, uh, you know, vast amounts of uh, information coming out and how we overcame that. But it, it was occurring to me that in some sense science um, was dealing with this problem of how do we find the truth and how do we trust what we are discovering together uh, way before. And Really, I think one thing that's important probably for a group like this is, is the idea that science itself offers us ways to try to build trust together. And it's been a, a very much a collaborative, uh, interactive activity for you know, all, of, all of its history. You know, Newton wouldn't be Newton if he didn't have people to write to and to, to hear from. And in some sense, we are now able to use and we should be teaching each other how to use all those techniques to deal with the current crisis. Great, thank you. Donna, I was gonna to turn to you next. Uh, it's wonderful, you're actually on stage and you, it's, it's like you're here. Um, uh, so, uh, so Donna, what, what about the, how does, how does today fit into the context of history? How does today fit into the context of history? history? Yeah. In um, well, I, I think what we're talking about is trust and I, I think in the past we've had more trust in science than we do now. Uh, and as Saul was just talking about, you know, scientists, always have this um, peer review process that we go through and go through and go through from when we try to write the proposal to get the um, money to do the idea to publishing the idea and in every step in between and we go to conferences and, and, and have conversations about what we do uh, and so I think this is a time where scientists are actually being asked to do more than just talk to each other I think that's probably one of the biggest differences between now and before scientists mostly spoke to each other and now we're being asked to uh, speak more broadly. That's great. Thank you. Rich, you have a joke that's along these lines. <laughs> uh, I, I promised I wouldn't tell it. Uh. But I, I would say laughter, I think, is really important. And I think the audience has really come, come apart, if you like, as soon as anybody says something funny. So I, I think the illusionist was really good. But just to get a, a little more serious for a moment, I think one of the things that I've gotten so far from the meeting is the importance of communication. Um, I think not just communication among ourselves, but to the general public, but also teaching our kids from a fairly early age about science. Because one of the wonderful things about kids is they're very open to science. They're open to new ideas. They, they're not coming in with a biased point of view unless their parents gave it to them, but most of them, they really want to know about this. And I think we could do a much better job of teaching kids at a younger age about this. This would be good. 
I also think one thing that came up recently um, because of COVID is that Zooming, which we do more and more all the time, is not like person to person. You cannot beat in-person communication because Saul can be talking <laughs> and I can interrupt him, but it's considered very um, do we go not to do that if you're on a Zoom call? You have to wait until you're asked. But I, I, I like the person to person. So I, I, t I take it you're planning on interrupting Saul. <laughs> All right. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> but to add, I may to add on to what you're, what you're saying. I think the, uh, this idea of education and, and what we teach the kids, mm -hmm. um, often we think of science education as being teaching biology, physics, chemistry. Um, but I think so much more should be taught about how science works. We have, I think, a real opportunity to be teaching a form of critical thinking, which is essentially what science consists of, and that would be powerful for everybody, whether or not they plan to become scientists. It provides them a, a route to grappling with this, this world that we live in. Right, and I think most kids start off being scientists. They're, they're creative, they ask questions, and we tend to put them into schools and not with science and the creativity and the curiosity out of them. And I think we need to flip that. We, we need to let them blossom. Let them question the teacher. There's nothing wrong with questioning the teacher. Um, yeah, so and, and, and I speak from personal experience. I got into <laughs> a lot of trouble when I was a kid. Donna, please. Donna's yeah, going to interrupt us. In. Yeah, come on. Uh, <laughs> I also think that the one thing that we lose in our education system is that we spend most of our time in science teaching them what science is already known. And then when we become scientists, our job is to figure out what we don't know. And so it would be nice if we introduced that concept. I think this goes back to what Rich is saying. They, sh they should learn how to ask the questions why in, in a critical thinking way um, through, through the education system and understand that, we, that there's far more we don't know than what we do know. I think it's really exciting. Yeah. That's, that's worth applause. Yeah. I think it's really exciting um, that each of you, in winning the Nobel Prize, you changed the way we think about something. And that was because there was something that was, we thought we knew, and, or we had some ideas about, and it turned out it didn't work that way. Um, that's the scientific process. We, we argue with each other. We, we, we have disagreements, and then we test it. Right, uh, but, but we don't shoot one another. That's good, I, and I'm glad, I'm glad for that. Would one, of you, would one of you want to speak to what that's like? Um, well, well, I will say that I think it's one of the real, I don't think most people realize it in the general public that the thing that really pays off for a scientist is when they get to say, oh, I was wrong. You know, the, uh, the world is completely different than I thought it was, and that's where the excitement you know, comes in. So that sense that you, know, you, you often get asked uh, by reporters, you know, so what did you set out to prove when you started working on this, on this project? And I keep thinking, well, if you set out to prove it, you probably weren't really doing science. And that's you know, the, the, the real fun of the game is to find out something that you didn't, uh, you didn't expect. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the important things is that very often you're doing experiments and they don't work and they fail, and you thought that you knew exactly how they were going to work, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And you look and see, why did it fail? You do a post-mortem on your experiments. This is when you make the big discoveries. This was certainly how it was for me. <laughs> Failure is a good thing. I think we don't do our kids any favors when we tell, oh, you're a failure, you failed that exam. Failure is great. Failure is terrific. <laughs> Well, let me add my example. Because so many people make such a big deal about I won the Nobel Prize for my very first paper. But I also point out that I was in my fourth year of my PhD. I had had that many failures getting to finally a really good success. So kind of averaged out, but I had so many failures uh, before I ever got to my first success. I, I don't know whether you guys have that experience, but my sense is that one of the things as a professor you are often trying to teach your, the uh, your upcoming generation is that they should not lose hope along the way, and that basically things are going to go wrong most of the time, and it's only the, you know, the very, very end that you'll, if you're lucky, something will, will work out. And maybe in, in some sense that's really the, one of the lessons for all of us facing misinformation in a, you know, the current whole story that we're worrying about. Um, it's, this is going to be a long process. You know, we'll, we'll get things wrong and we'll try lots of things, but 
that's how it works. You know, they, eventually you, you get somewhere. Is it that, um, is it in telling these stories of failure or in attempts and trying, by telling those stories, do we build trust within the scientific, uh, for the scientific community by telling the truth about the, the way that science works, the scientific process? Yeah. I, I, I would, I would I say yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Uh, truth is something that is really very valuable. And I think when people start lying about stuff, all that happens is they become politicians or they do something else. <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I think there should be a law that says if politicians lie, they can be sued and sent to jail. I mean, these are the people who represent us. But also, I think one of the first speakers today talked about how we can't just say science says, we have to explain. Yeah. And so we have to become good communicators, but also we live in the world of the sound bite. And it's very hard to explain science in a sound bite. Right? Yeah. And also, going back to the idea of explaining the scientific process, this was one of the concerns I had through COVID, is how many people got upset about the masking, no masking, what kind of masking, and they, and they threw up their hands and said, you know, sort of thought scientists were wrong. And really, I think what was happening is that they were watching a science experiment in, in real time for the first time in their lives, in that something was tried, it was tested, people figured out what, what was right and what was wrong, and they changed it. And this is what goes on in science. Um, and usually we have time to get to the final answer before we broadcast it, but because we were, people, scientists were trying to save lives, they were broadcasting as we went. And I think there wouldn't have been the frustration if we'd had the chance to explain, and also if people already understood the scientific process and why failure is a big part of it, but we learn and move on. Right, but you, you had the advantage that you lived in Canada where you had much better information coming your way. <laughs> so, so well, or we listened better. One of the other. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what does that say about um, the state of understanding of the scientific process in the United States and Canada and around the world uh, that we, we went through this test uh, and maybe we didn't do so well? I, th I think it certainly showed something that we have a lot to teach now, right? That this is a, a real opportunity for us to uh, get into the schools. In fact, there's a, a presentation coming up on the, uh, the last day of this, of this uh, summit um, about an a approach to teaching critical thinking in the schools that Nobel is, is supporting. And, uh, and I think this would be the real moment for us to start teaching how it is that you do all these different steps and different processes so that the students feel like they're part of the activity and that they they are able to use it. Right. But it. It just makes the case for more education. You know, I, I think kids, if they're educated well from a fairly early age, and I, I would say nine, 10 is a good time to get started. If they learn what the scientific process is, they can understand what people are saying to them, provided you don't have different, you know, different people coming. I mean, you know, the Surgeon General in Florida thinks that vaccines are bad. I mean, what? How, where on earth did he get his degree? I do not understand it. Maybe we should close that university that educated him. <laughs> Very subtly done. Very subtly done. <laughs> Donna, was there a difference? I mean, uh, in, in Canada, in terms, of, uh, in terms of the reaction because of, uh, of education, or was it similar? I don't know if it's education. I think politics came into the U.S. system far more than other places. Right. Yeah. Um, and this was also disheartening to me as a scientist that somehow people put their medical health information with some kind of uh, political blinders on. And so, I mean, maybe it's education, it's communication, it's a lot of things um, all at play. Um, but I, I don't think we had it that polarized up here in Canada. And so... Uh, that was a little bit easier to deal with, but right. but it's unfortunate when politics uh, and science collide this way. And, and it's it's interesting because the f the fields in which you all worked and and and, and got your uh, did your award winning work um, were perhaps not as um, uh, not as out in the open uh, at that time. So if there were folks who were spreading disinformation about supernovas when when uh, Saul when you were doing your work, 
Would it have been harder? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, but on the other hand, what I'm saying is there's an active combatant here. No, I always, I always felt that one of the big advantages of, of working in cosmology is that there's almost no <laughs> political position about whether the universe is <laughs> slowing down, speeding up, you know, so, so you're, uh, you're able to actually talk to people and, and their immediate reaction is pleasure. You know, they really actually enjoy uh, joining in. I so thought, that's one of the other aspects that science helps with if, you can, if you're in one of these areas. I thought everybody was against inflation. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, give me something here. That's a, that was a really good joke. Yeah. There was this period before the Big Bang that we called them, well, we'll explain it later. <laughs> if you're explaining, you're losing, right? Um, uh, so tell me about the, uh, you, you, Saul, you, you had one suggestion about things that we should be doing for the future. What should we be doing in this moment uh, as a community? And we've heard several prescriptions about it today. And which of those, if they caught your eye or if other things that you've heard from your own experience, should we be doing as a community uh, to, to help bridge this gap of trust? I mean, personally, I'm, I'm very interested in these issues of, of uh, participatory democracy and what does it take to uh, bring people into a conversation together so that the scientists are not in the position of being these sort of you know, sages telling everybody else the answer. Um, the scientists know something, you know, and as, uh, as Donna pointed out, they don't always know something about the current states of the facts that we have to live with and we have to, that we're trying to work around. But the scientists are not the experts in the, in the values and the, and the choices that need to be made um, once you know the facts. And that's the place where we, I think we do much better if we were part of a two-way conversation rather than you know, talking to the public as, as scientists. So I'm very interested in these techniques, like uh, we're doing this experiment tomorrow um, here at the summit in deliberative uh, democracy, deliberative polling is the kind we're doing uh, tomorrow. And the idea being there, you can have a public that's informed by discussion with the experts, but then they are the ones who deliberate and, and help come up with you know, what does a representative population think about the problem. Co-construction, I think, is the and, you know, and it seems like it's really the place to, to build a sense of, you know, of shared belonging and community that we also heard is so important. Yeah. Uh, Rich, same question. Yeah, so, you know, I've been impressed by people who are good at communicating with the public, who really take the time to learn a language so that they can explain what they do in ways that the general public can understand. And there's a couple of cities um, in Zurich, they do a very good job. Every, what they have one day every year where a whole bunch of scientists from the ETH go out and talk about their science. They sort of set up little stands on the streets and do it. In Exeter, in England, they do the same thing. The universities send out students, they send out professors, and talk about the work that they do, but in language that can be understood. And one thing we might think about doing when it comes to education is to make sure that science students are taught how to talk to the general public, how to use language that the general public can understand. I, I have something that I call the grandmother test, and the grandmother test is a student is doing something in the lab, they go home and they explain to their grandmother exactly what they do to a point where she actually can understand it. And the test is can she then go and talk to all her friends and tell her how smart her granddaughter is? <laughs> That's great. Uh, Donna, uh, from what you've heard today or from your own experience, what should we be doing in the future? Well, this is, I mean, uh, here at the University of Waterloo, we are trying to start a trust uh, network. And, and following on both what Rich and Saul say, uh, we do think it's, it's got to be a two-way conversation. And I think this has already been said today in, in the talks that, you know, scientists can't just really go out and say, this is what science says. And also, I think what we're just bringing up is that there are different groups of people who all have different reasons for whatever their culture is or whatever, for not trusting in some area of science. And so we have to start not only communicating better, but we really ha have to start listening um, to the communities to find out what it is that makes them not trust us. Uh, and then we're gonna have to have our social scientists and psychology uh, colleagues start figuring out the ways around this. And I hope to really do real science experiments, you know, try something, does it move the needle? Does it not move the needle? Um, and, and does it work for a number of groups of people or, or just a certain group of people? That's great, thank you, Donna. Um, in the final couple of minutes that we have, uh, this is, uh, the, the last part of this is hope. Um, 
I want you to just, in a, in a couple of words, and we've got two minutes, uh, a couple of words uh, say, what is it that, you ho- that you're hopeful about uh, in the next few years, either in the scientific realm or in the, the relationship between science and society? Uh, what are you hopeful about? What, what, what's got you excited? I think, oh. that, I think this meeting is, a, is you know, a great opportunity for hope. I mean, it seems to me that once you've identified a problem, then you have a fighting chance to do something about it. Yeah. And that I think that, you know, as experimentalists, we'll figure it out. You know, and I think we just uh, need those multiple tries that Don is talking about uh, until, we, until we start getting it. Rich? Now, I think it would be very good if we as scientists and the scientific societies could set up a factual database that people could trust. If you want to know whether something is true or false, you go to this gold standard database and know that what you read and what you find out about is true, it's factual, and the evidence is there. It leads to the evidence, to the papers, and whatever you want. That, I think, could make a huge difference, and it's something that the AI community could use productively, much more so than the way they're using the rubbish that goes into cheat GPT. I thought we were going to go 20 minutes without saying AI. All right, oh, Donna. Sorry. I think what I'm hopeful for is the fact that right now, it, this is a global problem, but I also think globally we're looking for solutions. And so certainly here at Waterloo with our network, umpteen others have reached out to us to say, how can we network together? And now, even though Rich doesn't like Zoom, luckily because we have Zoom, we can have global meetings and start talking together and each doing our own types of experiments and finding out what works, just like all other science, we can uh, get it out there in the global uh, sphere and maybe start changing the dial. So I am hopeful it's going to come together. Thank you, Donna. Uh, as you can see, uh, one, of the, one of the speakers before said that one of the solutions was wisdom. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom uh, on, the, on the right of me on this stage. So uh, thank you. Thank all three of you for, uh, for the panel. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.